All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to day three. Um, this morning we have a presentation from Olga Pikalnaya with South Coast AQMD. She's going to be discussing mobile technologies. So please welcome Olga. Thank you, Kyle. Good morning, everyone. Um, so what I'm going to try to do today is to give you a very brief uh, introduction to um, optical remote sensing and its application for, uh, for air quality monitoring. Until very recently, the traditional approach on assessing air quality and air quality impact was to conduct stationary monitoring at the at fully equipped uh, air monitoring stations um, and then um, collect emission inventory data, combine these two together in some sort of air quality modeling and uh, do perform calculations and uh, come up with um, with different types of assessment. Like for example here, I'm showing uh, an hourly AQI for the South Coast Air Quality Management District or the modeling of air toxics risk for one of our multi-air toxics programs. Um, also, when you talk about um, quantifying the emissions, the approach was uh, pretty, pretty similar. So you get, like, uh, you get a set, set of emission factors um, you have your facility, for example, if this is a refinery, uh, you know all your equipment, you combine all this information into emission estimation protocol and you get your emission inventory. Um, however, with the advancement of uh, uh, new, more modern monitoring techniques, uh, we, we, we are finding out that uh, that this uh, calculated emissions uh, are not always accurate and often uh, underestimated. And so, for example, here I'm showing two examples. This is um, this is something. This is the chart that was um, compiled by our Alex Kuklis, who used to work at the Texas Commission for Environmental Quality. When he looked at the measurements done by optical remote sensing at refineries around the world, um, and compared it with the you know what what the inventories said for emissions of specifically fugitive VOCs in this case, and he found that in most most cases, the emission, measured emissions were greatly higher. Then at South Coast AQMD, for the last few years, we've been conducting our, our own optical remote sensing surveys of our refineries, and we find in similar picture that in most cases, especially for VOCs, um, the, the, the discrepancy between, between emissions calculated through the inventories and measured emissions um, are different. And this is um, just the break, breakdown how it looks uh, by different refineries in the South Coast Air Basin for year 2015. Um, so there, there are also other sources uh, besides large industrial sources that may significantly contribute to, um, to, to air quality. And for example, in the South Coast Area Basin are the oil wells. So this is, um, this is a map of all oil wells um, in the LA Basin compiled by the Division of Oil and Gas. And you can see that we have thousands and thousands and thousands of oil wells, um, more than probably 5,000. And what are their emissions? Uh, they're very, very highly unknown. Again, you know, there are some uh, there are some emission factors that are applied to each well, but uh, you know, but it's really not very well understood and known how these emission factors actually compare to when you go and do take measurements of emissions in real time. So, and um, and another another very big. Uh, motivation for doing this type of real-time emission measurements, real-time air quality measurements, is to, assess, is to address community concerns. So communities are becoming more and more aware um, about air quality um, and more concerned about their localized air quality and they want uh, real-time information on their quality and there is a, uh, there is a number of, um, of uh, 
laws and regulations that have been adopted in California that you guys all know about that actually mandate community air monitoring and the, for refineries specifically fence line and community air monitoring, for example, like AB 617 or AB 1647. And so to address some of these challenges and some of these demands, one specific type of monitoring, it's becoming more and more widespread and also more and more important, and that's optical remote sensing. Uh, so it's matured quite a bit in the last, I would say, 10 years, and it allows us uh, to com conduct fully automated and continuous measurements without particularly um, your traditional requirements of calibrating, of instrumentation, and um, it's kind of ideal for long-term uh, fence line monitoring, for example, for a multitude of pollutants simultaneously, and it also can be deployed on a mobile platform. So there is a, there is a multitude of uh, optical remote sensing methods, but they all stem from, from the same principle. It's essentially the principle that, that's based on the Beer Lambert's law that says that light, when it goes through a medium, the constituents in that medium attenuate light um, in, in different constituents, constituents attenuate light in, in different wavelengths in a very unique way that you can essentially separate a different pollutants simultaneously and um, um, and because each of the pollutants has a very unique fingerprint, um, you essentially, with a little bit of work, um, can, uh, can conduct measurements very quickly and for, for multiple pollutants. And it works uh, with direct sunlight, scattered sunlight, and artificial sunlight. And depending on molecules that you would like to measure, you select essentially your optical remote sensing method and your wavelength. So it's very versatile. So picture worth a, a thousand words, and I had a little movie. Let's see, I'm gonna try one more time. It didn't work prior to start of this presentation, so I'm gonna try one more time and see whether that would work. All right, it doesn't. So I will, if you're interested to actually see the movie and other movies, uh, maybe contact me by my email and I'll send you links uh, to to, to this sort of visual presentations. But this is more like a cartoon to explain different types, different fundamental types of remote sensing. So as I just, saw, as I just said, the remote sensing can work with artificial sunlight, and this is, for example, presented here with the example of the long path um, instrument where you have a telescope that sends a light through the atmosphere, and that light path can be very long. Sometimes it'd be up to a kilometer away that, to your reflector, and then it sends back to your telescope, uh, and light gets analyzed for absorptions along that light path. And uh, with that, this, this method works both in the UV and IR, um, and you can conduct measurements during the day and during the night. Um, usually it's a permanent installation because um, you have retroreflectors, although most recently people also started putting these retroreflectors on drones, for example, and you can do like a very short-term measurement of emissions, for example, from a smokestack or from a small unit or something like this, depending on the time when your drone can stay up in the air. Um, another way of, of doing remote sensing, which is called the passive method, is actually using the light that already exists, which is a, a direct sca scattered or direct sunlight, and sometimes even people use moonlight as well. And uh, with, with this, you can, uh, you can also you can also measure a, a bunch of compounds. You're not as versatile in term, you're a little bit more restricted in, the terms of, in terms of pollutants that you wanna detect because obviously you don't have a control over your light. Uh, but you can do uh, much, more, much more other things because if you, get, you have a sunlight, you have actually quite a long light path. Um, so you can, you can detect lower concentrations of pollutants and you also uh, can conduct, depending on how you arrange your viewing geometry, you can also do a vertical profiling of pollutants or detecting like the entire, entire concentration throughout the boundary layer. So um, this is just an example of uh, 
one application of a suite of optical remote sensing techniques aboard a FluxSense mobile platform. So South Coast AQMD has been working with the Swedish company called FluxSense, which is um, a combination of uh, industry and um, academia uh, that, that developed this FluxSense mobile lab. And actually, we're in, we're in the process right now of assembling our own lab. But usually, all this equipment is, uh, is packed into a van. Um, and this is like the exterior of the van and interior of the van. And you see all these different instruments. So let me walk really quickly and see what, and, and actually explain what you're seeing here that we have inside of the van. Um, so we have four different optical techniques um, that essentially, by, by applying all of them together, we get a pretty complete picture of, uh, of various uh, VOCs and other pollutants when we conduct our mobile surveys. Um, so we have a solar occultation flux and the mobile Zenith SkyDOS instruments, which are both optical remote sensing instruments. Uh, one, isn't tight? <laughs> so one, the solar occultation flux works in the infrared and it's a direct sunlight measurement, while the mobile Zenith SkyDOS works in the UV visible and it collects a scattered sunlight. Um, and there's absorption of specific compounds that can be uh, measured by these two techniques. So the, these, these two instrumentation give us a direct measurement that, that can, can be translated into emission fluxes. Another two instruments aboard, aboard the lab are what we call extractive instruments. So they also they also based on um, on optical methods, but instead of using remote sensing, we essentially take air inlet into uh, with air into an optical cell and then um, and then analyze for absorptions. And again, you know, we have one cell that's analyzing in the infrared and another cell that door cell that's analyzing in UV um, to get to get a suite of compounds. So we essentially get a concentration mapping and concentration at the level of your air inlet of these trace gases as you drive along. And so by doing this, oops, by combining, um, so you get, you get as you, as you drive, you get your concentration mapping, but also by combining measurements from these two instruments with the measurements from these two instruments, you can also indirectly calculate fluxes um, of, um, of compounds uh, which perhaps like these two methods cannot uh, detect as accurately, for example, like BTEX. We cannot do it with was the, was the scattered, scattered uh, DOS instrument, but we can do it with the mobile white cell and then translate it to the emissions. Um, so unfortunately, video didn't work, but like just to see um, verbally, I guess, how the strategy works. So you have your, you have your van, you have your telescope on top, you drive around, you collect the sunlight, um, and then you cir cir circumvent a facility to get the upwind and downwind the contribution, and you combine this information with, uh, with the wind speed and wind direction um, and get fluxes. Um, and this is like a little example of uh, one transect around a small oil facility. So the blue, the blue, the dots are representing essentially a measurement point. And um, the, the, the warmer the color, the greater concentration or the greater column is that is detected by the, by the optical remote sensing instrument. And the little whiskers show up the wind, 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 wind speed and wind direction. Uh, so for example, here, if you can see that, that you, you, know, you, you circumvent the facility, the wind is coming from the south. So essentially, this part of the facility would be your downwind contribution. 
uh, from maybe something that's coming outside of the facility. Um, this is your upwind contribution. If you wanted to see what is the emission flux of, um, let's say, alkanes from this facility, all you would need to do, you would need to sum up all your downwind contribution and then subtract the upwind and, um, and calculate your emission flux based on your wind speed and wind direction. Um, another, so these are just examples also, just so you see how the instruments look of the extractive UV and FTIR cells. So it's nothing else as essentially like a very precisely aligned mirrors and it, it, they can be enclosed, for example, like in this case, and this one you can have inside your van and just have an air inlet, or it can be open and then you just put it on the top of your vehicle and drive through the air mass and measure concentrations as you drive through. Um, and um, you get, you know, you get very, you know, very good time response and a pretty good assessment of what's in the air that, that you drive. So kind of looking at um, the entire system, um, this is what I just described. But in order to get the, the emissions out, you need also another very big component, which I just mentioned, is the wind, wind speed and wind direction. And actually, when you do these measurements and you calculate fluxes, the biggest error and the biggest uncertainty is not here. This is pretty well defined. It's based on very known absorption cross sections and the, and the error of the measurement itself is very, very low. The biggest uncertainty actually comes from the wind because you have to have a very accurate vertical wind distribution. So to kind of reduce this uncertainty, what we have been using at South Coast AQMD, instead of uh, doing like a, like a measurement of the wind at one altitude or sending air zones, air zones like uh, once or twice a day, we've been actually using another optical remote sensing method that's, been called, that's called LIDAR um, to measure vertical wind profiles. And um, essentially you get the measurement every minute of a vertical wind profile from about, depending on the instrument, you can get as low as maybe like 50, 30 meters above the ground and up through the boundary layer. So um, just, um, just to kind of elaborate on, uh, you know, on what is the accuracy and precision of the method, the way to essentially validate that and verify that um, the approach is to use a controlled release experiment. And um, over, over the last you know, 10, 15 years, a lot of uh, optical remote sensing contractors have been conducting this controlled release experiment when you essentially release a known quantity of, um, of your target compound and you, know, you do a, usually a blind test to quantify what, what, you, what your emission rate is, and then you compare it with the true emission rate. Um, and this is an example of, uh, for example, for flux and specifically of a variety of uh, the controlled release experiments that they've done uh, with, the different, um, with the different gases and also compare with other, with other techniques. And on average, um, the typical uncertainty of the solar occultation flux method is about 30%. Um, and again, you know, to, to using LIDARs, we may decrease this uh, number a little bit, um, but that's, you know, but that's what it is. And um, so what can we do uh, besides calculating fluxes? What else can we do with this, with this optical remote sensing method, methods when we put it on the mobile platform? So first of all, we can, we can detect plumes as we drive around. So we can do exploratory uh, surveys to identify bad actors or identify a previously unknown problems. Um, and I just put like a few examples of, um, um, of uh, detection of plumes of alkanes and BTEX uh, from a various facility. This is like a small oil separation facility in Signal Hill in Los Angeles. Um, and this is also like actually like a small oil well 
like a measurement downwind of a small oil well also somewhere in Los Angeles. So this is very, very powerful tool. You just, you just drive around in the area where you, for example, suspect there are certain emissions are happening and you can pinpoint those plumes pretty rapidly and focus maybe other additional investigations more, um, more efficiently and more appropriately. Um, you can also do concentration mapping throughout the community to see like where, where hotspots, uh, pollution hotspots inside the community is. And these are just like a couple of little examples of uh, concentration mapping for BTEX um, within, the, within residential areas in Los Angeles that are adjacent to like very small oil wells and oil tanks. Just, you know, just an example of what you can do with these types of measurements. Um, so, and I think at this point I will stop. Um, I want to leave time for questions. And I just wanted to acknowledge uh, AQMD team, uh, my managers, Dr. Jason Lowe, Dr. Andrea Polidori, um, and uh, my group um, that's essentially doing uh, AQMD, development of AQMD, optical remote sensing program, and also FluxSense, who's, who we've been, been co cooperating with for the last few years. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to call or email me. And also, we have a fence line monitoring webpage where you can find additional, um, additional materials and uh, final reports and presentations from our previous studies. Thank you. All right, questions for Olga? Um, this is just trying to make sense of this. It looks like this is more looking for contribution sources as it is for more of an ambient monitoring. Is this geared more towards just looking how much a site is contributing because you're using your uh, upwind source as right. your reference and then your downwind is the contribution from the site? Right. So it's it's both. It depends. It's essentially you you can you can adjust your strategy depending on what your goal is. So if your goal is to see what is the contribution from the site, that specific site, then you you know you essentially circumvent that site to see you know what, what the emissions are from this site. But if you if you want to see how what is the distribution of pollutants, for example, in your neighborhood. You can just drive through streets, essentially, and if you find elevated levels of a certain pollutant, then you can go and investigate where is it coming from. Then what would be your zero reference? Uh, you, would, you don't need a zero reference. It's an absolute measurement. Like the measurement itself. But you're using a reference and measure source, so what would be your reference? If your reference is just an ambient source, so it depends, you know, if, you, if you're looking for emissions, specifically for emissions, then you do need this upwind, downwind contribution. But if you're just doing concentration mapping, then you don't need a reference. It's just what, like, you, you, you the, the measurement itself is an absolute measurement, so you drive around and you kind of get an idea of what your background in your neighborhood is, right? And then each neighborhood can be different, right? But if you're driving around and taking a background and taking a measurement at the same time, aren't you measuring the same thing? You don't need, to, in order to do a concentration mapping, you don't need to take a background. You only need a background if you try to establish what is the emissions from a certain facility. But if you're doing just concentration mapping, you don't need a background. Olga, this is very interesting, but I got to ask, what's the cost of the system? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, like, if the entire van, um, I guess, you know, it's like it's in the order of maybe $1.2, $1.5 million. Uh, 1. So it's, it's quite expensive, right? <laughs> But you know all this, you know all this technology is like as you know as it becomes more and more accessible. I'm hoping that the prices will also come down. Yeah. Um, this is super interesting. I'm just curious about the column measurements, and mm -hmm. I 
see that the detection limits, I understand call measurements are in terms of mass per area, um, but I'm just wondering if there's a way for you to give us a ballpark on what the, that might um, kind of correspond to on surface level concentrations in terms of detection limit. Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, so, so like with the, with the concentration mapping, like so with the extractive systems, you actually do get concentrations. And uh, for, you know, in the UV, for example, for like important pollutants like BTEX, um, it's uh, about, uh, it's around one PPB. So it de depends, you know, depends on your environmental condition, depends on your air. So, but like on average, it's about one PPB. For, for, for your column measurements, you can, I'll probably have to get back to you on that, but I think it's on, it's on the order. You can detect emissions of maybe like, for alkanes, maybe on the order of like half a kilogram per hour or something like this. That's where kind of your detection limit stands, yeah. Oh, thanks. Um, yeah, really interesting. Um, so you mentioned that, you know, for the emissions rates, it's within plus minus 30%. Um, what about just for the, the concentrations then? If, if, if the big issue is the, the MET data and that's where the variability comes in, what's the, uh, you know, accuracy of, of just concentration mapping then? Oh, that, that one is actually very accurate. So because, because you have, you know, essentially um, the, way that you, the, the way that you do your retrievals, they're based on the absorption cross-sections that are very well known. So your, you know, your error may be like, you know, maybe one or two percent at the most, depending on like different compounds have different absorption uncertainties to the absorption cross sections, but it's just an order of a few percent, yeah. Are there any issues with cross-contamination or cross-readings? Um, like how many points of the spectra are you actually analyzing? Because it looked like you were using just a few portions. Right, yeah, so, so you know, so, so you select is essentially for each compound, you know, sometimes you have multiple compounds that absorb in a certain window. So usually when you set up your evaluation, you essentially find the windows where like the least interferences. So how many compounds can I select within one window? Um, it depends. Like or for at example, time. for example, in the like if you if you take a measurement in the UV, in the single window you can do um, you can do formaldehyde, NO2, SO2, and ozone together, for example. And if you go like a little bit deeper UV, you can do benzene, toluene, essentially all BTEX in, in one of oh, the so you're not measuring all three ranges at the same time. You're only measuring one range. So you measure, you measure the entire range. Think about it like the spectrum. Let's say, for example, um, you measure every time you take a measurement, you essentially collect atmospheric spectrum in, in, a, in a certain wavelength region. And then you analyze the spectrum, different parts What's the of resolution the of your spectrometer then? Huh? What's the resolution of your spectrometer? Um, it depends. You know, these are pretty high resolution spectrometers. You, but, you know, you get in the UV, the, 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 the spectral range or the, or the range of the wavelength range, um, it's some, somewhere between 80 or 120 nanometers. That's usually, that, so you get quite a few, you get quite a few compounds at the same time. And infrared, it's actually much more. Okay, any more questions for Olga? All right, thank you. Thank you, Olga. Thank you.